Well, I'm going to go ahead and call this back into order in uh, open session and uh, do my reading glasses on. And do we have anybody sign up for public comment? No? Nope. Okay. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is uh, uh, take a part of item 7 uh, with, the con with the consent of the rest of the board. I'd like to take a part of item 7. Man has a, has a recognition deal that he's going to do. And then we'll jump down to item 9 and take up the budget. Uh, and item 10, pick up the budget and tariff as a decision item. So then we'll come back to uh, 7, 8, and then 11. So, uh, Matt, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to, I'll go quickly through this, but I wanted to take a second to. Uh, show the board a program that we've had in place now for three years. Um, when you look at customer service, when you look at our public communication, um, there are really four areas that we try to focus public communication. Uh, customer education, energy efficiency, uh, project helping hand, and public safety. And obviously public safety is one of the most important things we do. So we established a program uh, in partnership with LISD in 2015. Uh, and the idea was to take a group of our linemen and go talk to elementary school kids about how to be safe around electricity. And so fifth grade is when they learn about electricity. So we started this program off as a pilot just talking to fifth graders. It has since expanded out from there. Um, it typically runs from late March till the end of the school year. Uh, this year we presented to Bayless, Guadalupe, Hardwick, Ramirez, Charter, Western, Roscoe, Wilson. We talked to just over 1,700 kids uh, at these various different schools. So we made a video for them that is a short animated video. I'm not going to play it for you, although the linemen really wanted me to because <laughs> they've seen it a million times. And it is, it is a little bit annoying, but the kids do like it. So it's about a, about a four to five minute video, and it walks through the fundamentals of electricity, um, you know, we talked about what's a conductor, what's an insulator. We talked to them about the importance of conservation and energy efficiency. Uh, and importantly, we talked about safety. So here are a couple pictures from the different schools. This was Hardwick Elementary, uh, Ramirez Charter School, uh, Guadalupe, uh, and then Bayless Elementary, and that was the one where we had the most kids safe ended up bringing the entire elementary school in to watch the presentation. And so when we had the first and second graders in there, uh, we had to kind of tamp down some of the, uh, you know, this can kill you and it fries your insides and electricity. We didn't want to scare them too bad. Um, but, it, but it was interesting that after Bayless and after we got done with the presentation, one of the kids came up to me a little bit scared but said, I need to know what all the breakers are. <laughs> going to be fine, but it's, it's good at least that we have planted in their brain that they need to be aware of these things. And as Jimmy often tells the kids, you know, take this home to your brothers and your sisters and make sure as you get into summertime that they stay safe. So I'm going to attempt to do something here. I don't know if I'm technologically savvy enough to do it, but these are videos. And what we do is we take, we take this piece of equipment, which is an arcing demo about 7,000 volts of electricity. And what we do is we take different everyday items and we put it up here and we show them what happens when those items come into contact with electricity. So, unfortunately, it's not working all that well. But we walk through, we tell them, uh, you know, Corey, why he's wearing all this protective equipment, why it's important for them to be safe around electricity uh, if they're not wearing that equipment. Um, we, we show them our different safety equipment. We put a glove up there. And we show them that even the safety equipment, if it had just a small hole in it, that electricity can still get through it. So. 
and their favorite one is hot dogs. So we put a, we put a hot dog up there because hot dog is the best representation of what would happen if they touched it with their actual finger. So going forward um, and talking with LIC, we've agreed to continue growing the program over the coming years. We're going to look, I've been working with Michael Sizemore um, over there, and we're going to look this year at uh, having different times during the year that we can talk to more kids. Um, we're also talking to them about maybe taking some of the older kids and putting together a program where we have field trips where they can go to our power plants or go out and look at different equipment so the kids that are in high school that are interested in being electrical engineers or mechanical engineers uh, have the ability to come take a look at our, our program and see what we have going on. And very importantly, I wanted to dazzle stand up here. You know, we put this program together by Jimmy and JD and Corey, um, they really do all the work in this program. Um, they take a lot of pride in it. Uh, and they do this on top of their already busy schedule. And so I just wanted to point them out and give them a thanks and let y'all know that this is an important program we do and I couldn't do it without these guys. Scott Harrison too, although I don't want to give him as much credit. Just these guys. <laughs> Yeah, we do, and, and we work with LISD, and they typically come out and film, and then we do one of those uh, look around love it deals. Uh, we get a lot of good promotion out of it, but mostly the important thing is that the kids walk away from there having a better understanding of what they need to be saying, and that's that's what's important to us. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I was thinking we might bring this to a city council meeting. That citizen last week told me that we were acting like a bunch of first graders, so maybe we're not quite ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, no, the ceilings are tall enough that we can do it in the chamber, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all again. Appreciate you all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let me just get the... Uh, I'll go ahead and announce out of nine. Discuss and take action on the Love of Power and Life fiscal year 2017-2018 operating budget capital program to make appropriate recommendations to the City Council and the City of Lubbock pursuant to Section 2.03.415A of the Code of Ordinances, City of Lubbock, Texas. And uh, we're going we're gonna to pass the budget and then I guess we'll do the tariff next, right? Yes, those are in two separate items. Two separate items. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Oh, we're going to consider the budget. I'm sorry. Yes. All right, well, I... Uh, presented to you a preliminary budget uh, last month. Uh, first, I'd given a presentation to the Finance Committee on May 12th and then to the Electric Utility Board on May 16th. And uh, just a reminder, the uh, budget I presented last month was preliminary. There was some information in that that was not finalized. Uh, and since then, we have gotten all of that information. Some of those items that were not final at the time last month were uh, scheduled charges and internal service fund charges that we get from the city budget office. Also benefit amounts were not uh, updated. We had not received the uh, demand rate from SPS for the next year and so we've now received that and, and, and put that into the budget. And uh, also a cost of living adjustment. We spoke with the city manager and he gave us his best estimate at this point in time. What? he would be recommending in the city budget. So we have now folded that into ours as well. So there's a number of changes and I'll go over those in a little bit of detail here in a moment. Um, but really today's presentation is gonna be at a much higher level than last month. So I'm not gonna go over the same information again. Uh, just hit the high points uh, and then go over those changes that happened between presentations. Oops, I put the wrong one up here. You get a little preview of the Okay, now I'm at the budget. So, um, is it best for us to follow along in our budget book from last month or in the, in the uh, agenda book for this month? The agenda book for this month has it really that first section that has the narrative and then has all of the 
uh, kind of the high level recap sets where the current information is yes sir okay. the, the the book from last month that whole first section has really been re re renewed all the capital items in the back are basically the same with the exception of one addition to the capital program mm -hmm. that i'll go over with here in just a little bit so um and it's on 40 page 43 of your agenda book is the financial model which is kind of what i'll be talking about here for the, for the most part this budget it's not just a one-year snapshot in time. Uh, we, even though that's what you will approve, you will approve, uh, or at least you'll consider uh, the uh, next year's budget. But the financial model obviously is a, a multi-year uh, analysis and uh, of the strategic plan of the utility and where we're headed. And so uh, we also we want to put our budgets together, and we've done this over the last several years where there are no surprises in the future. And so that's the importance of that multi-year financial model. Some of the things included in that model are the ERCOT integration by 2021, the transition contract with SPS we've been talking about over the last several months is included in here, which begins in June of 2019 and extends through 2021. So all of that is incorporated in the financial model. There's significant capital investment in the model as well, about 300 million for transmission and distribution, which is about 84% of the total capital program. We also have the customer information systems, which is about 40 million, or about 11% of the capital program, which includes the billing system and the advanced meter and the mobile workforce management system. Andy, while you're on that, I yes, sir. probably have the time. I guess we just got the replies back, so to see if that's going to affect what we've done. No, we, we haven't had a chance to. We, we really just got the open the bids. Or the proposals this last week was it or right. was it this week? Okay. Right now the proposals have been received and are now being evaluated. So we have to go through that lengthy process on that before we even come down to a final trend like that. It's a full process, so we're not going to have anything. Uh, eval evals are not due until a month from now, pretty much. So that is underway. Transmission cost of service revenues are incorporated in the model in the out years. These are the revenues that we anticipate receiving once we enter into the ERCOT market uh, and, and will pay for a substantial amount of our transmission costs. It's a revenue stream we do not have today. Uh, the budget incorporates the use of general reserves in the future. Uh, at last month's meeting, uh, I had shown at one point in the future that we would be pulling down reserves almost $7 million below policy levels. With the, the revisions that have taken place between the month, um, it, it looks like that drawdown will be about six million. Uh, so about a million less than what we'd anticipated earlier. We'll still anticipate being below reserve policy levels uh, for a short period of time that will rebound quickly thereafter. The budget does include a base rate adjustment for this next fiscal year, which we talked about last month, and I'll talk about it again here in a moment. It also incorporates funding our debt service reserves. As you know, we'll be issuing a substantial amount of debt uh, over the next several years, and that entails the need to fund a cash reserve, which is required by our bond covenants. So that's incorporated in this budget. There is a 2% cost of living adjustment that has been uh, added to the budget since we met last. And then also there is a, a, a nice size reduction in uh, employee benefit cost for us uh, that we received from the city uh, between last month and this month. So um, one of our main goals is to you know really anticipate Lubbock's energy needs. It's always been that. Uh, they, the community relies on us to provide reliable and affordable energy. Uh, and so we accomplish this through long range planning of the transmission system and what needs to be done. So the focus of this budget isn't a lot different from the last several years. It's just getting a little bit more fine-tuned. And there's four points in this budget, or four attributes of this budget I wanted to talk about. First is the, uh, in the infrastructure, the transmission grid that's incorporated in here. I talked a moment ago about $300 million in the in the financial model in the next several years. Uh, for next year, though, it's $79.3 million, which is mainly for that inner and outer segments of the uh, transmission loops. So there's about 34 million uh, for new substations, about 24 million for new line construction or reconducting or uh, rebuilding of existing lines, and about 15 million for our distribution facilities, and about 6 million for geographic information systems and SCADA. 
second focus of this budget is the upgrading and replacement of our customer information systems, the uh, billing system that is antiquated, uh, the advanced meters that are in, uh, in the budget, as well as a mobile workforce management system that is also uh, over 10 years old. Thirdly is uh, the fact that we have continued to tighten our belt. Uh, this year it implements over a million dollars in cost savings that offset some of the increases in costs that we have elsewhere in the budget. Uh, the three years prior to this year, we had about 4.7 million in savings incorporated in this budget. So this takes that to about 5.7 million in reductions that we've had, uh, have found over the last several years. And then finally, uh, there is an, an addition to staffing in this budget, a net increase of 18 positions as we continue to upgrade our system and our, our information systems as well. So those are the, the big topics in the budget. And all of those uh, do drive some increases in cost. And uh, as you recall, in September, in 2014-15, we had proposed that over a five-year period, we would have a 5.75% base rate adjustment uh, to cover all the transmission program on all those drivers that are, uh, go along with that. As we've moved along, the, those first three years have already taken place. So we've had three years of 5.75% base rate only increases. Uh, in reviewing uh, the budget this year and with all the new information that we have, that we've gathered over the last couple of years, it looks like uh, for this next fiscal year, we're recommending a 5% base rate adjustment. And then we can eliminate that base rate adjustment for the 18-19 fiscal year based on the information we have today. So what impact uh, does that have? Uh, again, a base rate adjustment of 5%. The service availability charge, which is the charge to a customer for us to uh, read the meters, to uh, do the custom provide customer service, uh, is $7.69 a month today. It's rising to 8.07. That's a 5% increase, 38 cents a month increase. On the um, energy charge, we are recommending that we go to a flat rate for the energy charge. You can see currently it, um, we're at 3.837 cents in the summer, which would reduce a little less than a half a penny in the proposal. On the non-summer or the eight months of the year, more the winter-like months, going from 2.6 cents to about 3.38 cents. So about a three quarters of a cent increase in those cooler months. And then finally, purchase power is not impacted by this rate adjustment. Purchase power is the largest portion of the customer's bill, usually about two-thirds of the bill. And so um, that part is not affected. That, and remember, we pass that directly on the cost to us. We pass that directly on to the customer. So the, the reason, again, for uh, flattening out the, the variable part of the rate right. is what? Let, and let, let me show you on this okay. next slide. You can see that in this is the average residential customer. In the summer months, they average 1,300 kilowatt hours per month. And in the non-summer months, about 730. So almost double of the consumption in the summer months as in the non-summer months. If you look at this chart or this graph, this is the actual monthly average consumption of a residential customer. So you can see throughout the winter months, Again, an average of about 731 kilowatt hours. You can see in November and again in March is probably the lowest consumption months for us. The highest month in the winter is, is January when it's usually quite a bit cooler uh, at about 900, but, but on average 730. And you can see a big spike in the summer months. Uh, the average goes as high as 1500 in the month of July. So a very significant difference. And when you compound the significant increase in consumption with a higher rate, obviously that just compounds the problem. So our rationale in keeping a, a flat rate across the year is it, it yes, it does raise the winter uh, bills a little bit, but it also pulls down that summer, gets the season out. It's not quite so dramatic between seasons. I'm gonna go back to showing you what the, the monthly price would be for a, an average customer, but let me, kind of show you the impact uh, to a customer is about $1.89, the average customer a month increase is, that, is, is equal to that 5% increase. 
where that comes from is and we'll just focus on the summer column again you have that 38 cent increase for the service availability charge due to the lower rates in the summer months uh, the monthly amount in the summer will be about six dollars less for that average customer so total reduction of about five dollars and 69 cents a month during the summer you have four months of that so savings of about 22 dollars uh, for over the summer time frame over the winter over the eight month period the increase is about five dollars and thirty cents a month so it's about 570 total increase to the average customer times eight months is forty five dollars so the net impact across the 12 month time period is twenty two dollars you do divide that by 12 and it's a dollar eighty nine so that's the average impact over the year for the average customer if we had gone with a structure that's just a five percent increase on the current rate structure so you'd have a that would have given you a winter rate of 2.7 cents roughly and a summer rate of a little over four cents you can see what the impact would be the, the customer would have been paying about 25 to 35 dollars a month in the winter time for electricity and then it would jump to 65 70 dollars a month mm -hmm. in the summer again that's driven by consumption it's also compounded by a higher rate if you go with the proposed annual rate you can see how it raises those winter months so now you're in the 30 to 40 range during the winter months and in the summer rather than going up as high as 70 you're only going up to about 60 so um, you can see on average it's about 428 a month more in the winter and in the summer it's about 872 less if you do the math eight times four and four times eight it offsets each other that, that that this is a that's revenue neutral so this graph shows you that over the course of the year that customer is out the same amount of money on either scenario it's just it, it averages out a little bit better you're still going to have a spike in the summer but you know you all, that also helps people understand oh my bill's going to be high let me do what i can to keep my consumption down as much as possible so that's kind of a, an overview of the recommendation why we made it uh, how it impacts the customer um, and I know uh, Councilwoman Joy you had a concern last month about how it would impact it does this help to answer that question for you or did you so still have okay and, uh, let me just respond to the buyer's question in a kind of a different way uh, I think historically you've had summer winter rate differential that's kind of been a feature of uh, kind of standardized electric rates. What we've seen over the last few years is that people are getting away from that. And the idea behind having higher summer rates is that it encourages conservation at a time when the costs are higher. I mean, you've got demand, so you're setting high demands on your system, so you want to encourage conservation. But the market is moving away from that, and you know, in order for us to you know, kind of stay competitive here around, with, you know, that's one of the advantages of this is that our competitive position here around looks, you know, looks a little better. But that's, I think there's still plenty of incentive in the summertime just because of the high usage levels to encourage conservation. It would just, it's just not, you know, that would give them a double whammy of a higher rate plus higher usage. And uh, there's still a lot of incentive for folks to conserve in the summertime, which is what we would like to see. Does anybody else have any questions on, on what I've gone through so far? And I, the next several slides I wanted to go over the changes to what I presented to you last month this is on the department level aspect of the budget you can see on the first line is compensation and I mentioned that we folded in a 2% cost of living adjustment this was the amount that uh, Mr. Atkinson had recommended that we include in our budget and is most likely what he will be incorporating in the citywide budget so you can see that accounts about 277,000 uh, increase from last month Benefits are down a good bit, and uh, there is about a 10% reduction in health benefits and about a 25% reduction in dental benefits that we have rolled into this budget. So that, that's the driver of the decrease here, about $340,000 lower than what we presented to you last month. Supplies up just barely related to some adjustments in uh, fuel, uh, diesel fuel particularly, that the fleet department the city has provided to us. Uh, in late May, after the presentation, we did get the information from Southwestern Public Service on their demand rate 
for the next year. Every uh, June, roughly, they provide us that rate for the next 12 months. And that was up. Um, for, we, this year, it's $7.27 a kilowatt. <coughs> we had, we had, rec or we had estimated that that would rise about 7% to $7.75. We got word from them that it would be actually $7.93, which is about a little over a 9% increase over last year. So they continue to surprise us with large percentage increases. Uh, so that equated to about $1.6 million. And I remember that is part of the pass-through, so that does not impact the base rate. That piece does not impact our base rates. Uh, maintenance is down slightly um, and that had to do with our radio shop charges we had lower levels of lower number of radios in our budget so that saved us some money and then scheduled charges are down about 300,000 driven mostly by reductions in our water consumption at the plants uh, for next year that's about 450,000 in reduction in water and sewer at the plants um, and also there is some reductions in some other insurance products a liability particularly about a hundred thousand down there oh, that's all offset somewhat by um, an increase in, uh, in information technology we had a about an 18 percent increase uh, about three hundred fifty thousand dollar increase from IT for next year and I think they have some pretty significant projects to um, improve the reliability and uh, backup of our, of our system. So in total, on the department level, an increase of about 1.2 million over what you saw last month. On the fund level, uh, there's an increase to the transfer to our debt service reserve fund. You know, I mentioned a moment ago that as we issue uh, bonds for our transmission projects, we will be funding a cash reserve that's required by our bond covenants. We have added uh, between May and June a project is a mobile substation. There was some direction from the board at the last meeting that we consider adding that mobile substation. So we've done that, and, the, and that has really resulted in an increased need to transfer a little bit more to the debt service reserve fund. Then we also have some increases in the property tax and the franchise fee transfers to the general fund related to that increase in the capacity charge from SPS. So in total, a million four hundred twenty-eight thousand increase in expenses over last. I'm, I'm sorry, in um, yeah, in, in expenses. Sorry. The next slide is revenues. Um, slot change on interest. Uh, it's just formulaic on how that works. So there was also a Fed increase over the last um, back in the last week actually, and so uh, we've rolled all of that in. So all the changes plus that, uh, just a slight increase. The purchase power cost recovery, that's the revenues to cover that cost from SPS, a million six. Also the franchise fees that we will need to charge to cover that, about 76,000. Transfers from other found funds are down just slightly and that has to do with benefits uh, reduction. We, the, the water fund does pay for a dispatch uh, super position and with the reduction in health benefits that adjustment occurs there. That helps us keep in sync. We have to keep the transfers in and the transfers out in sync between all the funds. And so anytime we make a move, the city makes a move on the other side of the equation. That's a, it's a heart. And then this is a capital change that I mentioned a moment ago, uh, mobile substation, 2,555,000. Again, this is an estimate that we know today. Uh, we'll uh, obviously know more once we get bids in next year on that so this is just a high level overview kind of the same thing I just talked about just at a higher level you can see total funding sources up a million seven expenses are up a million four so what that means is that a little bit more will go into reserves about 276,000 will add to reserves more than what I presented to you last month and if you remember a moment ago I'd mentioned that in the future that we'll be pulling our reserves down I had said you know last month we were down almost seven million now we're going to be down almost six million and that has uh, everything to do with, with this change so that helped to keep us in that three years out not pulling down reserves quite as much as we had originally thought might be necessary and then my last slide is a comparison from the current year budget to next year's budget 
So just to kind of give a recap <laughs> on everything, so this folds in all of the changes we've made, but it also brings out kind of a high, high level look at the budget. So you see we're up about $9 million in purchase power cost. You can also see down below we're up about six and a half million in purchase power. The reason that those don't match is because we're anticipating ending this fiscal year in a still under collected position. About we anticipate will be about 2.6 million under collected. So that's why there's about a 2.6 million dollar difference in the budget between those two categories. Base rate revenues uh, are about three and a half million. That's the five percent increase on the on the base rate. Franchise fees are up about 470 thousand. Again, that's related to the changes in both purchase power revenues and the base rate uh, revenues. We have an increase of about 627 thousand on the other revenues, and which um, I'm drawing a blank on what that was. Um, mostly had to do with uh, the, the other revenues. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me look at my. That's not part of our uh, contingent sales. You sales? Yeah, thank you. Yes, that's what it is. The, the driver of that is. I know I look at this too much. <laughs> Thank you for saving me. I appreciate it. Uh, but that, that, that is the driver of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the transfers in are, are the, tra we talked about this last month. This is related to Citizens Tower. Uh, the, the four utilities, water, sewer, solid waste, and stormwater will transfer in uh, their portion of, of our share of the Citizens Tower. So total funding sources are up 14.8 million over the prior year. On the department level side, um, you can see that uh, expenses for department level are down uh, slightly. Um, purchase power and fuel, I talked about a moment ago, up to six and a half million. Capital outlay has really mostly to do with the, we had 500,000 uh, at each of the production units at Cook, Massengale, and Brandon for maintenance, uh, issues that we might entail. If you remember, we took out a substantial amount of the capital program or reduced it by several million dollars, what had originally been envisioned, and we've replaced it with the 500,000 each one just in case they have some significant issues that need to be repaired uh, going forward. So that's the driver of capital outlay. Debt service is up uh, about two and a half million. <coughs> Most of that has to do with us funding the debt service reserve fund. Uh, totaling about uh, 1.7 million. There's also about 800,000 in that number related to the capitalized interest that we'll be paying on those. The 30-year bonds for our transmission system, we will not be paying principal on those for the next, until we get into our COD, and so, but we will be paying interest, and that'll be covered under that cap I. Transfers out, 2.9 million. Uh, the bulk of that is our transfer to uh, the city for Citizens Tower at about 2.4 million. And remember, that's a kind of a three-year makeup. It won't be that large every year. Uh, it'll be about 1.2 million a year on, on going forward. But to catch up for the last couple of years plus next year, came up to about 2.4 million. And then 750,000 increase for pilot and franchise fees related to the increased uh, projected uh, power costs and revenues <coughs> associated with that. And then finally, the uh, reimbursements from the utilities. This is the portion that the four utilities pay us to provide customer service for them. Uh, it's around half of what the total cost is to provide customer service. That's up um, a, a little bit, mostly uh, a lot of that's driven by meter growth, but also due to some of the higher costs related to our uh, statements and uh, some of the redesign that we've done on all of that. So uh, that is kind of a high level, 12.3 million increase on expenses at uh, there so you can see we will be adding to reserves this year uh, but that's in anticipation of the large drawdown that will happen in the next couple of years um, so it's uh, has has an intended purpose not just growing reserves that's that's my overview of the budget and I'll be happy to answer any questions if y'all have any
Well, it, it's it's really all of the different things that we've been doing in the in the call center to ultimately it will go down with with the Cupra product and with outsourcing the bill print and all of that. But it's right now. Keep in mind that the that reimbursement from the utilities is two years it's based on two years old data really it's on it's only based on actual audited information and so it's based on the 15 16 years so whatever happened in 15 16 is what you're seeing here so there were some increased costs back then when we got the color printer and when we you know some of that stuff that came through over that 14 15 year there were some increases in that year so it's you have to go back in time a little bit. We'll, we're going to start seeing that number come down, and that's in the model as well. Those numbers will be coming down in the future once we make all these changes. Other questions? That 5% number going forward, just looking out further. We talked about leaving it in, leaving it out, and everything else. For the base yeah. rate adjustment? Yeah. Did we ever decide? It'll be, it will be. Right. We, we had gone over that last month and shown how the reserves uh, grew pretty dramatically in the out years. I, I was under the impression that the, the board seemed to be uh, given direction that the 5% and then that falling off in the future was okay. If y'all want me to go back and do anything else differently on that, I certainly can. No, I just saw it on that. Yeah. And, and I think that was uh, uh, something that we Again, I want to recognize, and unfortunately, well, Janet's here. Um, Chad is unable to be with us again today, and uh, then there's Jeremy Dixon and Janet Campbell, and of course, Teresa Larson has already moved on to her new job at United, so we're, we're missing her, but the group uh, has done a phenomenal job for us, and uh, we have first-rate staff, and I couldn't be more proud of them, and I want to always recognize the folks who are doing all the hard work behind the scenes, so you know, can't, can't go away without saying something. Well, and I'd like to echo those those uh, thoughts for the whole staff and the whole crew on the next job. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Let's take up uh, item 10 then. Discuss and take action on the fiscal year 2017 2018 electric rate tariff schedule and make appropriate recommendations to the City Council. The City of Lubbock, pursuant to 2.03.415A of the Code of Ordinances, City of Lubbock, Texas. Uh, again, is she going to take that one too? Yeah, I just have one slide on that. Um, you know, really the tariff changes are mostly made up of, you know, putting those increases throughout where they need to be on the rates. But the three things that, and I talked about these last month, they're incorporated in the tariff is that, first of all, that six month look back. Currently, the tariff, if we make a mistake, the current tariff does not allow us to go back beyond six months. And there have been other examples, not often, but on occasion that we run into that maybe, you know, a year or two over time, we may have made a mistake in billing a customer. And it's usually pretty unfair to 
uh, penalize that customer uh, because uh, of that tariff language. So we do not feel like this would be a significant fiscal impact to us. We feel like it's the right thing to do, and it opens us up where we, if we, if we have made a mistake in the past, we can go back and fix that and correct that with the customer. The second item on page 161 of that, well, actually, you know, well, I think those page numbers are the ones that were in last month's book. Um, yeah. So sorry about that. But uh, the refusal of service there, the PUC does provide um, reasons why we can refuse service under certain conditions. Uh, this is an industry standard and one, it's really a practice that we follow today. It's just never been uh, put into the tariff. And so of course that has to be related to equipment that is hazardous, uh, you know, where there's a debt owed, uh, there's an intent to deceive the utility or if there's a failure to make a deposit. Those are some uh, PUC provisions that, that we are going to recommend to implement into our tariff. And then the third is the demand cap, which is related, which is on several pages. Uh, this is a rate design that has really encouraged an efficient use of our system. And so we've been phasing it out. This will be our third year of that phase out. Uh, again, we will ensure that no customer sees more than a 20% adjustment on that portion of their bill. Uh, and so we've done the analysis on that. So those are the three areas that are changed other than the rate changes throughout the tariff. And so I'd, at this point in time, if you don't have any additional questions, I'd uh, recommend it for your consideration. Any questions on the tariff changes? We went over that pretty thoroughly last month, too. Mr. Andy? That's on the refusal of service. I don't know this, but is there already a provision in there to refuse service to any installation equipment that would be detrimental to our system? I'm not sure. You know, uh, that's, that's a good question, Mr. Bowman. I think we, we require uh, folks to new customers provide their usage information and their voltage requirements and their motor loads and all that sort of thing. I'm not sure it's specifically in this tariff policy. But, for I'm example, we've got, an twice we've got an interconnection agreement that the board approved for solar equipment and things like that. So it kind of touches on what you're asking. That it requires the customer to provide the information that, that they're connecting, but let our engineers take a look at it. Make sure it's you might have called it this thing we had out of the middle work information. Right. Things like that. Yeah, and in, in, in the uh, general terms and conditions, it's, it's actually the very first section that's on customer's installation. It just says, you know, the customer's responsible for installing and maintaining protective devices. Um, it talks about all the protective devices that are had. So it, it, it's um, all wiring and other electrical equipment furnished will be installed, operated, and maintained by the customer at all times in, in conformity with good electric practice and with requirements of the constituted authorities in terms of you know, these terms. So um, LPNL is not obligated to serve any equipment or premises that has a detrimental effect on LPNL equipment or equipment of LPNL customers. So I, that, that hits it right there. Last, last and I think we went over the example of the demand camp phase out, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. I can pull that up again if y'all want to want to go uh, there, through that. I, I have the slides. I just need to go pull them up if y'all want to uh, see that. Basically what happens, I'll explain it, you have, uh, say you have a customer, you know, they, you know their number of kilowatt hours, but we have a divisor, which if you look on page 176 or any of those pages, you'll, it's, it's a real minor change. We went from 58 hours to 50 hours. So the divisor is changed to a lower number. And so when we divide the number of kilowatt hours by that divisor, then it gives you the demand. And so, and if that demand is less than their actual demand, we've been billing them only that lesser amount. And so with that divisor coming down, that denominator coming down, that makes that actual demand charge grow. And, and until the point it gets to where it's equal to their actual demand, then they'll start being billed their actual demand amount. So that's kind of, hopefully that helps explain that. But it, right now, what's going on, or, or there are customers that are not paying for their actual use of demand and so that means other customers are subsidizing those customers who aren't paying their full freight on their demand charge and so as we we, we knew that you couldn't just unwind it all at once it would be a material impact and wouldn't allow those customers to 
prepare themselves or to prepare their equipment to operate more efficiently or whatever. Uh, and so that's why over a period of years we will phase that out. And so hopefully it's not a significant impact to that customer, but it also gets them to the point where they're paying for what they're using. It would be for any utility, actually. Any lumber. Yeah. City. Well, I don't know on the tariff. It may be. I don't know. Maybe that's a that's a difficult draw, line to draw because. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I didn't know yeah. when I paid my bill. I didn't pay the full amount when I'm paying. Um, there'll be a well, and if you, if you have electric. As a component of your bill, though, there's a portion of your electric charge that you have not paid if you have a past due amount. My claim it spreads the spreads the dollar across spread? all. Okay. That's that's right. I think so. But we're getting more and more water and sewer only customers in town that, that could have a water and sewer net that want to hook up on. So. Well, but that's that's probably credit we don't want. I mean, they're, they're not they're not credit worthy if they can't pay their bill. So Andy, the, in the uh, on the action item, um, in, in the background on page 67, it says the attached tariff includes a 5% rate increase for all rate classes. Yes, sir. So that's that, that's the base. That's that's the base rate we're considering, right? It's in our budget. That it's not not different than that. Yes, sir. That is exactly right. Okay, just want to make sure. And so every place where there's a rate listed, it, it has been increased by that 5%. And where there's a base rate. There's a base rate only. Yes, sir. Okay. Just make sure. You can read it. You can read it differently. And again, this is not effective until October 1. That's F approved by the board and by the council. Other comments or questions? Probably should have entertained a motion to approve it first, right? <laughs> Motion by Mr. Bowman. Second. Second, second by Mr. Conrad. Any other discussion? Uh, all those in favor of the tariff presented, uh, uh, please indicate by raising your hand. We got everybody. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. Um, let's go back to item seven then. Presentation discussion of the updated report by the director of electric utilities or his designee uh, regarding customer service, business center practices, procedures, and policy, billing forms and procedures, and the LPL staffing performance. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'm not going to hit, hit much in the way of highlights, but uh, happy to answer questions that the board might have. I would just mention in the construction report, we, we now have the citizens' power that there is a project. So it's okay, it's official now. Project. In the uh, in the list of items, thank you. When did those get put on? Uh, whenever whenever we uh, receive official requests for service or it gets it gets discussed at one of the city uh, meetings where they talk about it. Right. Are there any questions? I, I assume y'all went over the uh, in the record reporting the, uh, the materials that were emailed by the Questions for that on that. If there's not any questions on that, then let's go on to item A presentation, discussion of financial and capital statements, financing options, audits, and financial policy, and local planning line. Excuse me, relating to debt issuance issues, reserve account funding, cost allocation. Revenue and expense projections, purchase and power cost recovery factor, and customer meter, metering, billing and service issues. Maybe we did go to sleep on the Well, no, I, we, we took all this a little bit out of order, so I was going back. I just have a few slides to go over. Okay. I might not keep it short. Um, <coughs> this is the comparison for each of the rates uh, through um, April. We don't have a Texas average for April yet. There are some of the other utilities that haven't provided information yet. But you can still see that uh, we're below Excel, but we're a little bit above the uh, Texas average. 
Our customers have saved $255 to date compared to Excel and about $300 to date through into March uh, based on comparison with the Texas average. So, By the way, on this graph, you can really clearly see the winter-summer differential and how, how kind of outlined we are with everybody else. Yeah, we're a lot more dramatic in, in the seasons than everyone else. So that's a good point, Dave. Uh, every month I provide you with an update on the pass-through. Uh, we recommended last board meeting that we do not make any adjustments to that uh, pass-through rate and uh, we still anticipate that we'll be over collecting uh, going forward over the next uh, couple of months. Over the for April we did over collect about 800,000 which was more than what we'd anticipated. Towards the end of May we did have some warmer temperatures that uh, pushed up consumption above what we'd anticipated. So we are getting closer back into at least the bandwidth. Uh, we will certainly will be there over the next month or two. Um, I just want to do a quick overview of the budget uh, comparison where we are to date compared to, to budget. And really if you compare where we were this time last year, uh, we're really very much in sync. Uh, our revenues are a little bit better, a little bit more than they were this time last year. Our uh, purchase power though is also a little bit uh, higher than it was this time last year. The reason this says amended, remember at the last board meeting y'all approved uh, budget amendment and I've incorporated those numbers into this slide even though y'all didn't approve it until May. I've, I've adjusted the April numbers to show that comparison that makes it look a little bit more normalized between years now that we have that included. Um, so really nothing, no surprise there. You can see expenses are just slightly above the expense level from last year, uh, about a percent higher, but that's driven mostly by the purchase power increase over this time last year. So and we're, we're on track to hit our budget for this year. <coughs> on the capital program, uh, again, these are incorporating the amendments that were passed by the council and the board uh, last month. Uh, you can see we have about a little under 30 million remaining in bond funds for our capital program, about 10 million remaining in cash, so about 40 million roughly uh, in total uh, appropriation that we have not yet spent. And you can see in April the categories that we spent the most on, mostly in our underground and overhead, as that uh, growth in the city continues. Uh, not much else uh, of any magnitude to speak of this month. The one, th one th other thing I wanted to highlight was uh, we will be issuing bonds a little bit later in the year than we normally have. Normally we go out in, in the February or March time frame. This year we'll be doing it in uh, the August or July and August time frame. But uh, it is electric light and power system revenue bonds, um, series 2017. We'll have a 30-year term. There is a, will be a 10-year tranche and a 30-year tranche on there to, depending on what project is being funded. Our first interest payment on those bonds will be in October. The timeline, uh, on May 25th, the council approved the notice of intent, and that then triggers five publications in the newspaper, and so that is going on as we speak. Uh, in mid part of July, we'll be providing rating agency, rating agency presentations to all three rating agencies. At the last meeting in July, the council will consider the bond ordinance authorizing the issuance of the bonds. We will then go into the market on August the 1st or thereabout um, and to sell those bonds. One thing that the council does when they approve that ordinance is it is called a parameters ordinance, which uh, within certain parameters, the city is able to sell those bonds. So if there's a bad market one day, we can pull out and move it to a day where the market is a little bit more attractive. So that gives us some flexibility. We're not pinpointed to one day to sell bonds. And then those bonds will close on the 29th. There's a process where everything has to go to the Attorney General to get approved. And once that's approved, then all the funds can be dispersed from that bond sale. So before the end of the fiscal year, we will have that cash on hand. A lot of it will be to repay what we've already spent throughout this year. And it will also include some projects that are kicking off very shortly. This small, and I apologize, this is the list of all the projects. The top section is a 10-year tranche which is about 3.6 million and the bottom section is about 13.3 million for the 30-year projects. And then last slide I have just to kind of show you where you are. I know that uh, interest rates have been in the news lately. This last week the Federal Reserve increased rates. 
uh, but remember that's on the short end. That has had very limited impact on the longer end, or uh, we're, you know, we're issuing 30, 10 and 30 year bonds basically in this issuance. So you can see the yellow line is where we are today at about 3.7% for, and this is the bond by our 25 revenue bond index. So it's really based, our bonds will be a little bit longer than that, but very close. This is what we use as a benchmark. So you can see on the right hand side that since the 70s, less than 4% of the time have we been under 4%. And so even though we've heard of rate increases and they're, they're ongoing, it's really not that dramatic of an impact on our issuance coming forward. It's interesting to me to see how many times, 20% of the time it was in the 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 range, and 20% of the time is over 8%. So uh, we're still at the very, very low end of historical terms on interest rates. So I uh, just wanted to point that out, uh, that it's still not a bad time to issue bonds in the municipal marketplace. So that's all I had. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer those. Andy, I had a couple of, couple of things. Uh, on the uh, bond issuance issue, Those were a lot of that was reclass of capex, and um, there was also some charges at the beginning of the year that won't occur again. So we'll, it will trail off as the year goes on. I'm trying to. Chad is my expert on all that kind of detail, so I'm sorry. I'm no, it's uh, right. in the, in the uh, booklet. It's page 22 of the 102. Okay. Of the agenda book. Yeah. Yeah. You go down. You go down all the classifications, and basically, when you're seven months into the year, I mean, we're we're within tolerance of the percentage of budget on just about everything. Right. So there's only there's very few items that that are outside that. Yeah, let, 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 I'll have to go back and do some research on that specifically. I'm not off the top of my head. I'm not recalling what that okay. is. I know we've addressed it, but I just can't remember what the resolution was well, on that. So. I mean, we're not talking about huge amounts of money. It's just, right. I just so I go down and circle the ones that are kind of a little bit over track. So. Yep. Um, and the other thing you might you might touch on is on that statement of cash flows. What we were talking about earlier. The, uh, the capex expenditures in the state of cash flows is total cash expended for purchases, whereas our capex projects breaks it down by debt funded and uh, working capital. Right on. Uh, and, in to and in total for the project line. Right. Your, so the, your schedules that begin on page 27 of the document that show each individual capital project. All of those are based on a life to date uh, amount. And so anything, so some of those projects may have been open several years ago. Uh, and so, but, but you're right on the cash flow statement, which is then on page um, 17, yes, you will see that, uh, and what you're talking about is that third section, the first line purchases of capital assets, year to date is 7.7 .7 million. And that is just this current fiscal year's cash outlay or, for those projects, so it won't reconcile ever to those projects right. a little bit further back in the in the book. Cool. Yeah. And then we had the we had the large principal payment in April. Yeah, we uh, every, every April is our does our biggest bond payment uh, April fifteenth and uh, October fifteenth are our, in, our interest payments, and then April is when we pay principal. Principal this year was about ten million and about four million of interest uh, payments. And so we only have, we've already we've already made three payments this year. We have, when the city issued bonds historically, that they were certificates of obligation. Those payments are in February and in August. So we've already made the February payment. And then the uh, 
revenue bonds are October and April. And so we've made the October and the April. So the revenue bonds are paid off their portion for this year. We just lack the interest payment for the COs or certificates of obligation so we're, in August. We're like 87% or something through. Yes, the yes, because the, the interest payment in August will be relatively small. And that brings me to the last deal, and we talked about this earlier too, on, on the balance sheet. Basically, this is the low point. April is the low point for working capital because we make that big, we make that big bond payment out of our reserves, and so we kind of hit a we hit a low point uh, for the fiscal year in working capital. You can see it there, and you can also see it if you turn to page 18 on the budget comparison. If you look all the way at the very bottom of the page on the budget surplus or deficit. Yeah. 15 million dollars it always right. it always really right. scares me to death every year when we get to april and i see that right. but that's and i and i always go back and i look at prior years and yes we're exactly where we were last year it's just it's the timing of the large payment and then of course the summer revenues coming in will bring that cash back up to a level when we end the fiscal year we'll be back within that what we'd expect to have maybe a little bit of a drawdown on right. on reserves so. right. yeah you're right that's a better, that's a better place to see Anybody else got any questions on the budget and the financial statements? Uh, we're still on track on the, on the gap basis, changing that position, negative three and a half million. That's not, that's not unexpected. That's not unexpected at all. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's better than where we were this time last year. Um, but uh, also, it's it's very much on track. So we're, we monitor that monthly and make sure that we're heading in the right direction. Okay. Well, I guess if nobody else has a question or comment on that, Andy, thank you very much. Okay. Thank Appreciate you. Okay. Uh, let's take up item 11, consider resolution authorizing the director of electric utilities to execute that certain First Amendment professional services contract buying between the city of Lubbock, acting by and through Lubbock Fire and Life Department. Engineering services related to boring activities. That's boring holes, not boring activities. <laughs> and electric transmission and distribution issues related to the same. Uh, this is a uh, this is a company that we have been using for some time. We've had a number of uh, projects that go to town. We've got the large industrial customer and other places around town where we're trying to get figures across the loop. Uh, and I think we just, we've expended the funds that we had in there initially to, to uh, uh, get additional authorization because we have some more projects pending. These are these are public works type projects that, that take seal drawings to do the work in the public right away and, and to monitor the work to make sure it conforms to the uh, design engineering drawings. And so we also source those and we've had uh, a good working relationship with working with students. I, I think this uh, in, your, in your materials, the background or agenda item summary starts on page 116, and then there's a uh, resolution on page, uh, well, information 116, 117, and resolution on page 118. So I guess uh, what I should do, Mr. Kennedy, is entertain a motion, and then we'll discuss the mission for the company. Motion. Motion by Ms. Henry. Second. Second by Mr. Bowman. Okay. Now, any other uh, information, questions, <coughs> comments concerning that particular item? Y'all are all clear. We're talking about uh, design services uh, and all the items that are attached to uh, the back page that's on page 17.
right, so basically your motion is to approve items 13 through 17. Okay. Is there a second? Second by Mr. O. Uh, all those in favor of approving 13 through 17, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now, we'll take it by uh, 12. I guess the best way to do that, Mr. Kedger, is to uh, hear a motion to do something with it? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. The, the motions could be to approve, to approve okay. as, as long as they are, or to, to, to okay. continue to a date for for the event, sir. Okay. Mr. Chair? Mr. Bell? If someone were to make a motion to approve this with the addition of quarterly or sooner reports, at the discretion of the director, I would say that motion. Did you look in your Robert's rules for Chair, prospective motions are. <laughs> Chair, we entertain the motion to table. Motion by Mr. Odom, second by Mr. McCullough. All those in favor of tabling item 12, please say aye. 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 All right. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, for recognition of Robert Schulz of Order. Uh, <laughs> well, if we table it till the next meeting. Table the next meeting. Right. Isn't that the proper that's, procedure? We can table it to the next meeting. That's an event, certain. And so. we'll take it up off the table at that point. Correct? <laughs> we can't hold. It's, it's one of those things where there, there's some, uh, there's a funny video out there. And, and probably I ought to show it sometime on uh, Robert's Rules. But there's a guy that lays down on the table. On the table. <laughs> and, he, and he lays on the table and he says, I'm going to lay here for the duration of this meeting. At which point time I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to get up off get the table. Get up off So, you know, I've always viewed that, that if, you're, if you're moving away from the meeting, it's a motion to continue, but they're used interchangeably. Well, however you feel like you're already for it. And let me let me ask this: if, if it's the board's if it's the board's desire that this that the delegation resolution not be considered until routing is complete, mm -hmm. uh, or routing is ripe for discussion, then perhaps a, a, a continuance to, to that event would uh, would be more accurate with the board's desire. If it's the board's desire that, that it just be cut off a month and then be considered again, then, then what the board has done is it, it, it would be the way to go. I'm fine with that as long as we're not going to slow down the process. That's the last answer. We, 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 can, we can bring separately to the board and the council next month the individual select and substation. As a separate uh, as, a, as, a, as a separate yes. individual thing, and put off the delegation until the routing of that is. I believe that's our intent. I will put words in your mouth. I will be in the word that motion. So this would be a motion to continue uh, until the, the resolution is made. Since we, so let me give you a Since we, uh, since we approved that other one, we need to have a move to reconsider that item and then and then the motion uh, stated as the so uh, so we need to bring uh, bring that back at uh, 12 for reconsideration thank you okay and to uh, the second for that thank you okay all right so and now we can state the reconsideration or we have to you, you, someone would, would move to continue until the uh, until the ballot from the northwest of McKenzie subsection is discussed. That's what they did. Yeah, if I had yeah, to do that. So what I say this motion is, is to continue until the ballot from the northwest subsection is reconsidered. Well, then the separate item is reconsidered. Okay. So is there a second for that? Okay. Now, everyone in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate you, Richard. You keep us on track. And, uh, and that's what we do. So, all right, y'all. I believe we've got all the way to uh, item 18.